5. A Terrible Experience with Extremely Dangerous Drugs There was no way to cope with it. I stood up and gathered my luggage. It was important, I felt, to get out of town immediately. My attorney seemed to finally grasp this. Wait, he shouted. You can't leave me alone in this snake pit. This room is in my name. I shrugged. Okay, goddammit, he said, moving toward the phone. Look, I'll call her. I'll get her off our backs. He nodded. You're right. She's my problem. I shook my head. No, it's gone too far. You'd make a piss-poor lawyer, he replied. Relax, I'll handle this. He dialed the Americana and asked for 1600 Hi, Lucy, he said. Yeah, it's me. I got your message. What? Hell no, I taught the bastard a lesson he'll never forget. What? No, not dead, but he won't be bothering anybody for a while. Yeah, I left him out there. I stomped him and pulled all his teeth out. Jesus, I thought. What a terrible thing to lay on somebody with a head full of acid. But here's the problem, he was saying. I have to leave here right away. That bastard cashed a bad check downstairs and gave you as a reference, so they'll be looking for both of you. Yeah, I know, but you can't judge a book by its cover, Lucy. Some people are just basically rotten. Anyway, the last thing in the world you want to do is call this hotel again. They'll trace the call and put you straight behind bars. No, I'm moving to the Tropicana right away. I'll call you from there when I know my room number. Yeah, probably two hours. I have to act casual or they'll capture me, too. I think I'll probably use a different name, but I'll let you know what it is. Sure, just as soon as I check in. What? Of course, we'll go to the circus circus and catch the polar bear act. It'll freak you right out. He was nervously shifting the phone from ear to ear while he talked. No, listen, I have to get off. They probably have the phone tapped. Yeah, I know it was horrible, but it's all over now. Oh, my God, they're kicking the door down. He hurled the phone down and began shouting, No, get away from me, I'm innocent. It was Duke, I swear to God. He kicked the phone against the wall, then leaned down to it and began yelling again. No, I don't know where she is. I think she went back to Montana. You'll never catch Lucy, she's gone. He kicked the receiver again, then picked it up and held it about a foot away from his mouth as he uttered a long, quavering groan. No, no. Don't put that thing on me, he screamed. Then he slammed the phone down. Well, he said quietly, that's that. She's probably stuffing herself down the incinerator about now. He smiled. Yeah, I think that's the last we'll be hearing from Luce. I slumped on the bed. His performance had given me a bad jolt. For a moment I thought his mind had snapped that he actually believed he was being attacked by invisible enemies. But the room was quiet again. He was back in his chair watching Mission Impossible and fumbling idly with the hash pipe. It was empty. Where's that opium? he asked. I tossed him the kit bag. Be careful, I muttered. There's not much left. He chuckled. As your attorney, he said, I advise you not to worry. He nodded toward the bathroom. Take a hit out of that little brown bottle in my shaving kit. What is it? Adrenochrome, he said. You won't need much, just a little tiny taste. I got the bottle and dipped the head of a paper match into it. That's about right, he said. That stuff makes pure mescaline seem like ginger beer. You'll go completely crazy if you take too much. I licked the end of the match. Where'd you get this? I asked. You can't buy it. Never mind, he said. It's absolutely pure. I shook my head sadly. Jesus, what kind of monster client have you picked up this time? There's only one source for this stuff. 
He nodded. The adrenaline glands from a living human body, I said. It's no good if you get it out of a corpse. I know, he replied, but the guy didn't have any cash. He's one of these Satanism freaks. He offered me human blood, said it would make me higher than I'd ever been in my life. He laughed. I thought he was kidding, so I told him I'd just as soon have an ounce or so of pure adrenochrome, or maybe just a fresh adrenaline gland to chew on. I could already feel the stuff working on me. The first wave felt like a combination of mescaline and methadrine. Maybe I should take a swim, I thought. Yeah, my attorney was saying. They nail this guy for child molesting, but he swears he didn't do it. Why should I fuck with children, he says. They're too small, he shrugged. Christ, what could I say? Even a goddamn werewolf is entitled to legal counsel. I didn't dare turn the creep down. He might have picked up a letter opener and gone after my pineal gland. Why not, I said. He could probably get Melvin Belli for that. I nodded, barely able to talk now. My body felt like I'd just been wired into a 220-volt socket. Shit, we should get us some of that stuff. I muttered finally. Just eat a big handful and see what happens. Some of what? Extract of pineal. He stared at me. Sure, he said. That's a good idea. One whiff of that shit would turn you into something out of a goddamn medical encyclopedia. Man, your head would swell up like a watermelon. You'd probably gain about a hundred pounds in two hours claws, bleeding warts. Then you'd notice about six huge hairy tits swelling up on your back. He shook his head emphatically. Man, I'll try just about anything, but I'd never in hell touch a pineal gland. Last Christmas, somebody gave me a whole Jimson weed. The root must have weighed two pounds, enough for a year. But I ate the whole goddamn thing in about twenty minutes. I was leaning toward him, following his words intently. The slightest hesitation made me want to grab him by the throat and force him to talk faster. Right, I said eagerly. Jimson weed, what happened? Luckily, I vomited most of it right back up, he said. But even so, I went blind for three days. Christ, I couldn't even walk. My whole body turned to wax. I was such a mess that they had to haul me back to the ranch house in a wheelbarrow. They said I was trying to talk, but I sounded like a raccoon. Fantastic, I said, but I could barely hear him. I was so wired that my hands were clawing uncontrollably at the bedspread, jerking it right out from under me while he talked. My heels were dug into the mattress, with both knees locked. I could feel my eyeballs swelling about to pop out of the sockets. Finish the fucking story, I snarled. What happened? What about the glands? He backed away, keeping an eye on me as he edged across the room. Maybe you need another drink, he said nervously. Jesus, that stuff got right on top of you, didn't it? I tried to smile. Well, nothing worse. No, this is worse. It was hard to move my jaws. My tongue felt like burning magnesium. No. Nothing to worry about, I hissed. Maybe if you could just shove me into the pool or something. God damn it, he said. You took too much. You're about to explode. Jesus, look at your face. I couldn't move. Total paralysis now. Every muscle in my body was contracted. I couldn't even move my eyeballs, much less turn my head or talk. It won't last long, he said. The first rush is the worst. Just ride the bastard out. If I put you in the pool right now, you'd sink like a goddamn stone. Death. I was sure of it. Not even my lungs seemed to be functioning. I needed artificial respiration, but I couldn't open my mouth to say so. I was going to die, just sitting there on the bed, unable to move. Well, at least there's no pain. Probably I'll black out in a few seconds, and after that it won't matter. 
My attorney had gone back to watching television. The news was on again. Nixon's face filled the screen with his speech was hopelessly garbled. The only word I could make out was sacrifice, over and over again. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. I could hear myself breathing heavily. My attorney seemed to notice. Just stay relaxed, he said over his shoulder, without looking at me. Don't try to fight it or you'll start getting brain bubbles, strokes, aneurysms. You'll just wither up and die. His hand snaked out to change channels. It was after midnight when I finally was able to talk and move around. But I was still not free of the drug. The voltage had merely been cranked down from 220 to 110. I was a babbling, nervous wreck, flapping around the room like a wild animal, pouring sweat and unable to concentrate on any one thought for more than two or three seconds at a time. My attorney put down the phone after making several calls. There's only one place where we can get fresh salmon, he said and it's closed on Sunday. Of course, I snapped. These goddamn Jesus freaks, they're multiplying like rats. He eyed me curiously. What about the process, I said. Don't they have a place here? Maybe a delicatessen or something? With a few tables in back? They have a fantastic menu in London. I ate there once. Incredible food. Get a grip on yourself, he said. You don't want to even mention the process in this town. You're right, I said. Call Inspector Bloor. He knows about food. I think he has a list. Better to call room service, he said. We can get the Crab Louie and a quarter Christian Brothers Muscatel for about 20 bucks. No, I said. We must get out of this place. I need air. Let's drive up to Reno and get a big tuna fish salad. Hell, it won't take long. Only about 400 miles, no traffic out there on the desert. Forget it, he said. That's army territory, bomb tests, nerve gas. We'd never make it. We wound up at a place called The Big Flip, about halfway downtown. I had a New York steak for $1.88. My attorney ordered the Coyote Bush Basket for $2.09. And after that, we drank off a pot of watery Golden West coffee and watched four boozed-up cowboy types kick a faggot half to death between the pinball machines. The action never stops in this town, said my attorney as we shuffled out to the car. A man with the right contacts could probably pick up all the fresh adrenochrome he wanted if he hung around here for a while. I agreed... But I wasn't quite up to it right then. I hadn't slept for something like 80 hours, and that fearful ordeal with the drug had left me completely exhausted. Tomorrow we would have to get serious. The drug conference was scheduled to kick off at noon, and we were still not sure how to handle it. So we drove back to the hotel and watched a British horror film on The Late Show. Six. Getting down to business. Opening day at the drug convention. On behalf of the prosecuting attorneys of this county, I welcome you. We sat in the rear fringe of a crowd of about 1,500 in the main ballroom of the Dunes Hotel. Far up in front of the room, barely visible from the rear... The executive director of the National District Attorneys Association, a middle-aged, well-groomed, successful GOP businessman type named Patrick Healy, was opening their third national institute on narcotics and dangerous drugs. His remarks reached us by way of a big, low-fidelity speaker mounted on a steel pole in our corner. Perhaps a dozen others were spotted around the room, all facing the rear and looming over the crowd, so that no matter where you sat or even tried to hide, you were always looking down the muzzle of a big speaker. This produced an odd effect. 
People in each section of the ballroom tended to stare at the nearest voice box, instead of watching the distant figure of whoever was actually talking far up front on the podium. This 1935 style of speaker placement totally depersonalized the room. There was something ominous and authoritarian about it. Whoever set up that sound system was probably some kind of sheriff's auxiliary technician on leave from a drive-in theater in Muskogee, Illinois, where the management couldn't afford individual car speakers and relied on ten huge horns mounted on telephone poles in the parking area. A year or so earlier, I had been to the Sky River Rock Festival in rural Washington, where a dozen stone-broke freaks from the Seattle Liberation Front had assembled a sound system that carried every small note of an acoustic guitar, even a cough or the sound of a boot dropping on the stage, to half-deaf acid victims huddled under bushes a half-mile away. But the best technicians available to the National DA's convention in Vegas apparently couldn't handle it. Their sound system looked like something Ulysses S. Grant might have triggered up to address his troops during the siege of Vicksburg. The voices from up front crackled with a fuzzy, high-pitched urgency, and the delay was just enough to keep the words disconcertingly out of phase with the speaker's gestures. We must come to terms with the drug culture in this country. 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 These echoes drifted back to the rear in confused waves. The reefer bud is called a roach because it resembles a cockroach. 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 What the fuck are these people talking about? My attorney whispered. You'd have to be crazy on acid to think a joint looked like a goddamn cockroach. I shrugged. It was clear that we'd stumbled into a prehistoric gathering. The voice of a drug expert named Bloomquist crackled out of the nearby speakers. About these flashbacks, the patient never knows. He thinks it's all over and he gets himself straightened out for six months, and then, darn it, the whole trip comes back on him. Gosh darn that fiendish LSD. Dr. E. R. Bloomquist, M.D., was the keynote speaker, one of the big stars of the conference. He is the author of a paperback book titled Marijuana, which, according to the cover, tells it like it is. He is also the inventor of the roach-cockroach theory. According to the book jacket, he is an associate clinical professor of surgery, anesthesiology, at the University of Southern California School of Medicine, and also a well-known authority on the abuse of dangerous drugs. Dr. Bloomquist has appeared on national network television panels, has served as a consultant for government agencies, was a member of the Committee on Narcotics Addiction and Alcoholism of the Council on Mental Health of the American Medical Association. His wisdom is massively reprinted and distributed, says the publisher. He is clearly one of the heavies on that circuit of second-rate academic hustlers who get paid anywhere from 500 to 1,000 bucks a hit for lecturing to cop crap. Dr. Bloomquist's book is a compendium of state bullshit. On page 49, he explains the four states of being in the cannabis society. Cool, groovy, hip, and square, in that descending order. The square is seldom, if ever, cool, says Bloomquist. He is not with it. That is, he doesn't know what's happening. But if he manages to figure it out, he moves up a notch to hip. And if he can bring himself to approve of what's happening, he becomes groovy. And after that, with much luck and perseverance, he can rise to the rank of cool. Bloomquist writes like somebody who once bearded Tim Leary in a campus cocktail lounge and paid for all the drinks. And it was probably somebody like Leary who told him with a straight face that sunglasses are known in the drug culture as T-shades. This is the kind of dangerous gibberish that used to be posted in the form of mimeographed bulletins in police department locker rooms. Indeed, know your dope fiend, your life 
may depend on it. You will not be able to see his eyes because of tea shades, but his knuckles will be white from inner tension, and his pants will be crusted with semen from constantly jacking off when he can't find a rape victim. He will stagger and babble when questioned. He will not respect your badge. The dope fiend fears nothing. He will attack for no reason with every weapon at his command, including yours. Beware! Any officer apprehending a suspected marijuana addict should use all necessary force immediately. One stitch in time, on him, will usually save nine on you. Good luck, the chief. Indeed, luck is always important, especially in Las Vegas, and ours was getting worse. It was clear at a glance that this drug conference was not what we'd planned on, It was far too open, too mixed. About a third of the crowd looked like they'd just stopped by for the show and route to a Fraser Ali rematch at the Vegas Convention Center across town. Or maybe a benefit bout for old smack dealers between Liston and Marshall Key. The room fairly bristled with beards, mustaches, and super mod dress. The DA's conference had obviously drawn a goodly contingent of undercover narcs and other twilight types. An assistant DA from Chicago wore a light tan sleeveless knit suit. His lady was the star of the Dunes Casino. She flashed through the place like Grace Slick at a Finch College class reunion. They were a classic couple, stone swingers. Just because you're a cop these days doesn't mean you can't be with it. And this conference attracted some real peacocks. But my own costume, $40 FBI wingtips and a Pat Boone Madras sports coat, was just about right for the mass median. Because for every urban hipster, there were about 20 crude-looking rednecks who could have passed for assistant football coaches at Mississippi State. These were the people who made my attorney nervous. Like most Californians, he was shocked to actually see these people from the outback. Here was the cop cream from middle America. And Jesus, they looked and talked like a gang of drunken pig farmers. I tried to console him. They're actually nice people, I said, once you get to know them. He smiled. Know them? Are you kidding? Man, I know these people in my goddamn blood. Don't mention that word around here, I said. You'll get them excited. He nodded. You're right. I saw these bastards in Easy Rider, but I didn't believe they were real. Not like this. Not hundreds of them. My attorney was wearing a double-breasted blue pinstripe suit, a far more stylish outfit than my own, but it made him exceedingly nervous. Because to be stylishly dressed in this crowd meant that you were probably an undercover cop. And my attorney makes his living with people who are very sensitive in that area. This is a fucking nightmare, he kept muttering. Here I am infiltrating a goddamn pig conference. But sure as hell, there's some dope dealing bomb freak in this town who's gonna recognize me and put the word out that I'm out here partying with a thousand cops. We all wore name tags. They came with a $100 registration fee. Mine said I was a private investigator from L.A., which was true in a sense. And my attorney's name tag identified him as an expert in criminal drug analysis, which was also true in a sense. But nobody seemed to care who was what or why. Security was too loose for that kind of gritty paranoia. But we were also a bit tense because we'd given the registrar a bad check for our dual registration fee. It was a check from one of my attorney's pimp drug underworld clients that he assumed from long experience was absolutely worthless. Seven. Motto on invitations to National DA's convention in Vegas. April 25 through 29, 1971. If you don't know, come to learn. If you know, come to teach. The first session, the opening remarks, 
lasted most of the afternoon. We sat patiently through the first two hours, although it was clear from the start that we weren't going to learn anything, and it was equally clear that we'd be crazy to try any teaching. It was easy enough to sit there with a head full of mescaline and listen to hour after hour of irrelevant gibberish. There was certainly no risk involved. These poor bastards didn't know mescaline from macaroni. I suspect we could have done the whole thing on acid, except for some of the people. There were faces and bodies in that group who would have been absolutely unendurable on acid. The sight of a 344-pound police chief from Waco, Texas, necking openly with his 290-pound wife, or whatever woman he had with him, when the lights were turned off for a dope film, was just barely tolerable on mescaline, which is mainly a sensual surface drug that exaggerates reality instead of altering it. But with a head full of acid, the sight of two fantastically obese human beings far gone in a public grope while a thousand cops all around them watched a movie about the dangers of marijuana would not be emotionally acceptable. The brain would reject it. The medulla would attempt to close itself off from the signals it was getting from the frontal lobes. And the middle brain, meanwhile would be trying desperately to put a different interpretation on the scene before passing it back to the medulla and the risk of physical action. Acid is a relatively complex drug in its effects, while mescaline is pretty simple and straightforward. But in a scene like this, the difference was academic. There was simply no call at this conference for anything but a massive consumption of downers, reds, grass, and booze, because the whole program had apparently been set up by people who had been in a second-all stupor since 1964. Here were more than a thousand top-level cops telling each other, we must come to terms with the drug culture. But they had no idea where to start. They couldn't even find the goddamn thing. There were rumors in the hallways that maybe the mafia was behind it, or perhaps the Beatles. At one point, somebody in the audience asked Bloomquist if he thought Margaret Mead's strange behavior of late might possibly be explained by a private marijuana addiction. I really don't know, Bloomquist replied. But at her age, if she did smoke grass, she'd have one hell of a trip. The audience roared with laughter at this remark. My attorney leaned over to whisper that he was leaving. I'll be down in the casino, he said. I know a hell of a lot of better ways to waste my time than listening to this bullshit. He stood up, knocking his ashtray off the arm of his chair, and plunged down the aisle toward the door. The seats were not arranged for random movement. People tried to make a path for him, but there was no room to move. Watch yourself, somebody shouted as he bulled over them. Fuck you, he snarled. Down in front, somebody else yelled. By now he was almost to the door. I have to get out, he shouted. I don't belong here. Good riddance, said a voice. He paused, looking around, but he seemed to think better of it and kept moving. By the time he got to the exit, the whole rear of the room was in turmoil. Even Bloomquist, far up front on the stage, seemed aware of a distant trouble. He stopped talking and peered nervously in the direction of the noise. Probably he thought a brawl had erupted, maybe a racial conflict of some kind, something that couldn't be helped. I stood up and plunged toward the door. It seemed like as good a time as any to flee. Pardon me, I feel sick. I said to the first leg I stepped on. It jerked back, and I said it again. Sorry, I'm about to be sick. Sorry, sick. Beg pardon, yes, feeling sick. This time a path opened very nicely. Not a word of protest. Hands actually helped me along. They feared I was about to vomit, and nobody wanted it. At least not on them. I made it to the door in about 45 seconds. My attorney was downstairs at the bar, talking to a sporty-looking cop about 40 whose plastic name tag said he was the D.A. from someplace in Georgia. I'm a whiskey man myself, he was saying. 
We don't have much problem with drugs down where I come from. You will, said my attorney. One of these nights you'll wake up and find the junkie tearing your bedroom apart. No, said the Georgia man. Not down in my parts. I joined them and ordered a tall glass of rum with ice. You're another one of these California boys, he said. Your friend here has been telling me about dope fiends. They're everywhere, I said. Nobody's safe. And sure as hell not in the South. They like the warm weather. They work in pairs, said my attorney. Sometimes in gangs. They'll climb right into your bedroom and sit on your chest with big bowie knives. He nodded solemnly. They might even sit on your wife's chest, put the blade right down on her throat. Jesus God Almighty, said the Southerner. What the hell's going on in this country? You'd never believe it, said my attorney. In L.A., it's out of control. First it was drugs, now it's witchcraft. Witchcraft? Shit, you can't mean it. Read the newspapers, I said. Man, you don't know trouble until you have to face down a bunch of these addicts gone crazy for human sacrifice. No, he said. That's science fiction stuff. Not where we operate, said my attorney. Hell, in Malibu alone, these goddamn Satan worshippers kill six or eight people every day. He paused to sip his drink. And all they want is the blood, he continued. They'll take people right off the street if they have to. He nodded. Hell yes, just the other day we had a case where they grabbed a girl right out of a McDonald's hamburger stand. She was a waitress, about 16 years old, with a lot of people watching, too. What happened? said our friend. What did they do to her? He seemed very agitated by what he was hearing. Do, said my attorney. Jesus Christ, man, they chopped her goddamn head off right there in the parking lot. Then they cut all kinds of holes in her and sucked out the blood. God almighty, the Georgia man exclaimed. And nobody did anything? What could they do? I said. The guy that took the head was about six, seven, and maybe three hundred pounds. He was packing two Lugers, and the others had M16s. They were all veterans. The big guy used to be a major in the Marines, said my attorney. We know where he lives, but we can't get near the house. No, our friend shouted. Not a major. He wanted the pineal gland, I said. That's how he got so big. When he quit the Marines, he was just a little guy. Oh, my God, said our friend. That's horrible. It happens every day, said my attorney. Usually it's whole families during the night. Most of them don't even wake up until they feel their heads going. And then, of course, it's the bartender had stopped to listen. I'd been watching him. His expression was not calm. Three more rums, I said, with plenty of ice and maybe a handful of lime chunks. He nodded but I could see that his mind was not on his work. He was staring at our name tags. Are you guys with that police convention upstairs? He said finally. We sure are, my friend, said the Georgia man with a big smile. The bartender shook his head sadly. I thought so, he said. I never heard that kind of talk at this bar before. Jesus Christ, how do you guys stand that kind of work? My attorney smiled at him. We like it, he said. It's groovy. The bartender drew back. His face was a mask of repugnance. What's wrong with you, I said. Hell, somebody has to do it. He stared at me for a moment, then turned away. Hurry up with those drinks, said my attorney. We're thirsty. He laughed and rolled his eyes as the bartender glanced back at him. Only two rums, he said. Make mine a Bloody Mary. The bartender seemed to stiffen, but our Georgia friend didn't notice. His mind was somewhere else. Hell, I really hate to hear this, he said quietly, because everything that happens in California seems to get down our way sooner or later. Mostly Atlanta, but I guess that was back when the goddamn bastards were peaceful. 
It used to be that all we had to do was keep them under surveillance. They didn't roam around much, he shrugged. But now, Jesus, nobody's safe. They could turn up anywhere. You're right, said my attorney. We learned that in California. You remember where Manson turned up, don't you? Right out in the middle of Death Valley. He had a whole army of sex fiends out there. We only got our hands on a few. Most of the crew got away, just ran off across the sand dunes like big lizards, and every one of them stark naked except for the weapons. They'll turn up somewhere pretty soon, I said, and let's hope we'll be ready for them. The Georgia man whacked his fist on the bar. But we can't just lock ourselves in the house and be prisoners, he exclaimed. We don't even know who these people are. How do you recognize them? You can't my attorney replied. The only way to do it is to take the bull by the horns, go to the mat with this scum. What do you mean by that? he asked. You know what I mean, said my attorney. We've done it before and we can damn well do it again. Cut their goddamn heads off, I said. Every one of them. That's what we're doing in California. What? Sure, said my attorney. It's all on the QT, but everybody who matters is with us all the way down the line. God, I had no idea it was that bad out there, said our friend. We keep it quiet, I said. It's not the kind of thing you'd want to talk about upstairs, for instance, not with the press around. Our man agreed. Hell no, he said. We'd never hear the goddamn end of it. Dobermans don't talk, I said. What? Sometimes it's easier to just rip out the back straps, said my attorney. They'll fight like hell if you try to take the head without dogs. God almighty. We left him at the bar, swirling the ice in his drink and not smiling. He was worried about whether or not to tell his wife about it. She'd never understand, he muttered. You know how women are. I nodded. My attorney was already gone, scurrying through a maze of slot machines toward the front door. I said goodbye to our friend, warning him not to say anything about what we'd told him. 8. Backdoor Beauty and Finally a Bit of Serious Drag Racing on the Strip Sometime around midnight, my attorney wanted coffee. He had been vomiting fairly regularly as we drove around the strip, and the right flank of the whale was badly streaked. We were idling at a stoplight in front of the silver slipper beside a big blue Ford with Oklahoma plates. Two hoggish-looking couples in the car, probably cops from Muskogee, using the drug conference to give their wives a look at Vegas. They looked like they'd just beaten Caesar's Palace for about $33 at the blackjack tables, and now they were headed for the circus circus to whoop it up. But suddenly they found themselves next to a white Cadillac convertible all covered with vomit and a 300-pound Samoan in a yellow fishnet T-shirt yelling at them. Hey there, you folks want to buy some heroin? No reply, no sign of recognition. They've been warned about this kind of crap. Just ignore it. Hey, honkies! My attorney screamed. God damn it, I'm serious. I want to sell you some pure fucking smack. He was leaning out of the car, very close to them. But still nobody answered. I glanced over very briefly and saw four middle American faces frozen with shock, staring straight ahead. We were in the middle lane. A quick left turn would be illegal. We would have to go straight ahead when the light changed, then escape at the next corner. I waited, tapping the accelerator nervously. My attorney was losing control. Cheap heroin, he was shouting. This is the real stuff. You won't get hooked. God damn it, I know what I have here. He whacked on the side of the car as if to get their attention, but they wanted no part of us. You folks never talked to a vet before? said my attorney. I just got back from Vietnam. 
This is Skag, folks. Pure Skag. Suddenly the light changed, and the Ford bolted off like a rocket. I stomped on the accelerator and stayed right next to them for about 200 yards, watching for cops in the mirror, while my attorney kept screaming at them. Shoot! Fuck! Skag! Blood! Heroin! Rape! Cheap! Communist! Jab it right into your fucking eyeballs! We were approaching the circus circus at high speed, and the Oklahoma car was veering left, trying to muscle into the turn lane. I stomped the whale into passing gear, and we ran fender to fender for a moment. He wasn't up to hitting me. There was horror in his eyes. The man in the back seat lost control of himself, lunging across his wife and snarling wildly. You dirty bastards! Pull over and I'll kill you! God damn you, you bastards! He seemed ready to leap out the window and into our car, crazy with rage. Luckily, the Ford was a two-door. He couldn't get out. We were coming up to the next stoplight, and the Ford was still trying to move left. We were both running full bore. I glanced over my shoulder and saw that we'd left the other traffic far behind. There was a big opening to the right. So I mashed on the brake, hurling my attorney against the dashboard, and in the instant the Ford surged ahead, I cut across his tail and zoomed into a side street, a sharp right turn across three lanes of traffic. But it worked. We left the Ford stalled in the middle of the intersection, hung in the middle of a screeching left turn. With a little luck, he'd be arrested for reckless driving." My attorney was laughing as we careened in low gear with the lights out through a dusty tangle of back streets behind the desert inn. Jesus Christ, he said. Those Okies were getting excited. That guy in the back seat was trying to bite me. Shit, he was frothing at the mouth. He nodded solemnly. I should have maced the fucker. A criminal psychotic. Total breakdown. You never know when they're likely to explode. I swung the whale into a turn that seemed to lead out of the maze, but instead of skidding, the bastard almost rolled. Holy shit, my attorney screamed. Turn on the fucking lights. He was clinging to the top of the windshield, and suddenly he was doing the big spit again, leaning over the side. I refused to slow down until I was sure nobody was following us, especially that Oklahoma Ford. Those people were definitely dangerous, at least until they calmed down. Would they report that terrible quick encounter to the police? Probably not. It had happened too fast with no witnesses, and the odds were pretty good that nobody would believe them anyway. The idea that two heroin pushers in a white Cadillac convertible would be dragging up and down the strip, abusing total strangers at stoplights, was prima facie absurd. Not even Sonny Liston ever got that far out of control. We made another turn and almost rolled again. The Coupe de Ville is not your ideal machine for high-speed cornering in residential neighborhoods. The handling is very mushy, unlike the Red Shark, which had responded very nicely to situations requiring the quick four-wheel drift. But the whale, instead of cutting loose at the critical moment, had a tendency to dig in which accounted for that sickening, here-we-go sensation. At first I thought it was only because the tires were soft, so I took it into the Texaco station next to the Flamingo and had the tires pumped up to 50 pounds each, which alarmed the attendant until I explained that these were experimental tires. But 50 pounds each didn't help the cornering, so I went back a few hours later and told him I wanted to try 75. He shook his head nervously. Not me, he said, handing me the ear hose. Here, to your tires, you do it. What's wrong? I asked. You think they can't take 75? He nodded, moving away, as I stooped to deal with the left front. You're damn right, he said. Those tires want 28 in the front, 32 in the rear. Hell, 50's dangerous, but 75 is crazy. They'll explode. I shook my head and kept filling the left front. I told you, I said. Sandoz Laboratories designed these tires. They're special. I could load them up to a hundred. God almighty, he groaned. 
Don't do that here. Not today, I replied. I want to see how they corner with 75. He chuckled. You won't even get to the corner, mister. We'll see, I said, moving around to the rear with the air hose. In truth, I was nervous. The two front ones were tighter than snare drums. They felt like teak wood when I tapped on them with the rod. But what the hell, I thought. If they explode, so what? It's not often that a man gets a chance to run terminal experiments on a virgin Cadillac and four brand new $80 tires. For all I knew, the thing might start cornering like a Lotus Elan. If not, all I had to do was call the VIP agency and have another one delivered. Maybe threaten them with a lawsuit because all four tires had exploded on me while driving in heavy traffic. Demand an Eldorado next time with four Michelin X's and put it all on the card. Charge it to the St. Louis Browns. As it turned out, the whale behaved very nicely with the altered tire pressures. The ride was a trifle rough. I could feel every pebble on the highway, like being on roller skates in a gravel pit. But the thing began cornering in a very stylish manner, very much like driving a motorcycle at top speed in a hard rain. One slip and zang, over the high side, cartwheeling across the landscape with your head in your hands. About thirty minutes after our brush with the Okies, we pulled into an all-night diner on the Tonopah Highway, on the outskirts of a mean skag ghetto called North Las Vegas, which is actually outside the city limits of Vegas proper. North Vegas is where you go when you fucked up once too often on the Strip, and when you're not even welcome in the cut-rate downtown places around Casino Center. This is Nevada's answer to East St. Louis. A slum in a graveyard. Last stop before permanent exile to Ely or Winnemucca. North Vegas is where you go if you're a hooker turning 40 and the syndicate men on the strip decide you're no longer much good for business out there with the high rollers. Or if you're a pimp with bad credit at the Sands. Or what they still call in Vegas a hophead. This can mean almost anything from a mean drunk to a junkie, but in terms of commercial acceptability, it means you're finished in all the right places. The big hotels and casinos pay a lot of muscle to make sure the high rollers don't have even momentary hassles with undesirables. Security in a place like Caesar's Palace is super tense and strict. Probably a third of the people on the floor at any given time are either shills or watchdogs. Public drunks and known pickpockets are dealt with instantly, hustled out to the parking lot by Secret Service-type thugs and given a quick impersonal lecture about the cost of dental work and the difficulties of trying to make a living with two broken arms. The high side of Vegas is probably the most closed society west of Sicily, and it makes no difference in terms of the day-to-day -day lifestyle of the place, whether the man at the top is Lucky Luciano or Howard Hughes. In an economy where Tom Jones can make $75,000 a week for two shows a night at Caesars, the palace guard is indispensable, and they don't care who signs their paychecks. A gold mine like Vegas breeds its own army, like any other gold mine. Hired muscle tends to accumulate in fast layers around money power poles. And big money in Vegas is synonymous with the power to protect it. So once you get blacklisted on the Strip for any reason at all, you either get out of town or retire to nurse your act along on the cheap, in the shoddy limbo of North Vegas. Out there with the gunsels, the hustlers, the drug cripples, and all the other losers. North Vegas, for instance, is where you go if you need to score smack before midnight with no references. But if you're looking for cocaine and you're ready up front with some bills and the proper code words, you want to stay on the strip and get next to a well-connected hooker, which will take at least one bill for starters. And so much for all that. We didn't fit the mold. 
There is no formula for finding yourself in Vegas with a white Cadillac full of drugs and nothing to mix with properly. The Fillmore style never quite caught on here. People like Sinatra and Dean Martin are still considered far out in Vegas. The underground newspaper here, the Las Vegas Free Press, is a cautious echo of the people's world, or maybe the National Guardian. A week in Vegas is like stumbling into a time warp, a regression to the late 50s, which is wholly understandable when you see the people who come here, the big spenders from places like Denver and Dallas, along with National Elks Club conventions, no niggers allowed, and the all-West volunteer Sheep Herders Rally. These are people who go absolutely crazy at the sight of an old hooker stripping down to her pasties and prancing out on the runway to the big beat sound of a dozen 50-year-old junkies kicking out the jams on September song. It was sometime around three when we pulled into the parking lot of the North Vegas Diner. I was looking for a copy of the Los Angeles Times for news of the outside world, but a quick glance at the newspaper racks made a bad joke of that notion. They don't need the Times in North Vegas. No news is good news. Fuck newspapers, said my attorney. What we need right now is coffee. I agreed, but I stole a copy of the Vegas Sun anyway. It was yesterday's edition, but I didn't care. The idea of entering a coffee shop without a newspaper in my hands made me nervous. There was always the sports section. Get wired on the baseball scores and pro football rumors. Bart Starr beaten by thugs in Chicago Tavern. Packers seek trade. Namath quits Jets to be governor of Alabama. And a speculative piece on page 46 about a rookie sensation named Harrison Fire out of Grambling. Runs the 109 flat. 344 pounds and still growing. This man fire has definite promise, says the coach. Yesterday before practice, he destroyed a greyhound bus with his bare hands, and last night he killed a subway. He's a natural for color TV. I'm not one to play favorites, but it looks like we'll have to make room for him. Indeed. There is always room on TV for a man who can beat people to jelly in nine flat. But not many of these were gathered on this night in the North Star Coffee Lounge. We had the place to ourselves, which proved to be fortunate because we'd eaten two more pellets of mescaline on the way over, and the effects were beginning to manifest. My attorney was no longer vomiting or even acting sick. He ordered coffee with the authority of a man long accustomed to quick service. The waitress had the appearance of a very old hooker who had finally found her place in life. She was definitely in charge here, and she eyed us with obvious disapproval as we settled onto our stools. I wasn't paying much attention. The North Star Coffee Lounge seemed like a fairly safe haven from our storms. There are some you go into in this line of work that you know will be heavy. The details don't matter. All you know for sure is that your brain starts humming with brutal vibes as you approach the front door. Something wild and evil is about to happen, and it's going to involve you. But there was nothing in the atmosphere of the North Star to put me on my guard. The waitress was passively hostile, but I was accustomed to that. She was a big woman, not fat, but large in every way. Long, sinewy arms and a brawler's jawbone. A burned-out caricature of Jane Russell. Big head of dark hair. Face slashed with lipstick and a 48 double E chest that was probably spectacular about 20 years ago when she might have been a mama for the Hells Angels chapter in Berdu. But now she was strapped up in a giant pink elastic brassiere that showed like a bandage through the sweaty white rayon of her uniform. Probably she was married to somebody, but I didn't feel like speculating. All I wanted from her tonight was a cup of black coffee and a 29-cent hamburger with pickles and onions. No hassles, no talk, just a place to rest and regroup. I wasn't even hungry. 
My attorney had no newspaper or anything else to compel his attention, so he focused, out of boredom, on the waitress. She was taking our orders like a robot when he punched through her crust with a demand for two glasses of ice water, with ice. My attorney drank his in one long gulp, then asked for another. I noticed that the waitress seemed tense. Fuck it, I thought. I was reading the funnies. About ten minutes later, when she brought the hamburgers, I saw my attorney hand her a napkin with something printed on it. He did it very casually, with no expression at all on his face. But I knew from the vibes that our peace was about to be shattered. What was that? I asked him. He shrugged, smiling vaguely at the waitress who was standing about ten feet away at the end of the counter, keeping her back to us while she pondered the napkin. Finally she turned and stared. Then she stepped resolutely forward and tossed the napkin at my attorney. What is this? she snapped. A napkin, said my attorney. There was a moment of nasty silence, then she began screaming. Don't give me that bullshit! I know what it means, you goddamn fat pimp bastard! My attorney picked up the napkin, looked at what he'd written, then dropped it back on the counter. That's the name of a horse I used to own, he said calmly. What's wrong with you? You son of a bitch, she screamed. I take a lot of shit in this place, but I sure as hell don't have to take it off a spick pimp. Jesus, I thought, what's happening? I was watching the woman's hands, hoping she wouldn't pick up anything sharp or heavy. I picked up the napkin and read what the bastard had printed on it in careful red letters. Back door beauty question mark. The question mark was emphasized. The woman was screaming again. Pay your bill and get the hell out. You want me to call the cops? I reached for my wallet, but my attorney was already on his feet, never taking his eyes off the woman. Then he reached under his shirt, not into his pocket, coming up suddenly with the Gerber Mini Magnum, a nasty silver blade which the waitress seemed to understand instantly. She froze, her eyes fixed wildly on the blade. My attorney, still watching her, moved about six feet down the aisle and lifted the receiver off the hook of the payphone. He sliced it off and brought the receiver back to his stool and sat down. The waitress didn't move. I was stupid with shock, not knowing whether to run or start laughing. How much is that lemon meringue pie? my attorney asked. His voice was casual, as if he had just wandered into the place and was debating what to order. Thirty-five cents, the woman blurted. Her eyes were turgid with fear, but her brain was apparently functioning on some basic motor survival level. My attorney laughed. I mean the whole pie, he said. She moaned. My attorney put a bill on the counter. Let's say it's five dollars, he said. Okay? She nodded, still frozen, watching my attorney as he walked around the counter and got the pie out of the display case. I prepared to leave. The waitress was clearly in shock. The sight of the blade jerked out in the heat of an argument had apparently triggered bad memories. The glazed look in her eyes said her throat had been cut. She was still in the grip of paralysis when we left. 9. Breakdown on Paradise Boulevard Editor's Note At this point in the chronology, Dr. Duke appears to have broken down completely. The original manuscript is so splintered that we were forced to seek out the original tape recording and transcribe it verbatim. We made no attempt to edit this section, and Dr. Duke refused even to read it. There was no way to reach him. The only address-slash-contact we had during this period was a mobile phone unit somewhere on Highway 61, and all efforts to reach Duke at that number proved futile. In the interests of journalistic purity, we are publishing the following section just as it came off the tape, one of many that Dr. Duke submitted for purposes of verification, along with his manuscript. 
According to the tape, this section follows an episode involving Duke, his attorney, and a waitress at an all-night diner in North Vegas. The rationale for the following transaction appears to be based on a feeling shared by both Duke and his attorney that the American dream would have to be sought out somewhere far beyond the dreary confines of the District Attorney's Conference on Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. The transcription begins somewhere on the northeast outskirts of Las Vegas, zooming along Paradise Road in the White Whale. Boulder City is to the right. Is that a town? Yeah. Let's go to Boulder City. All right, let's get some coffee somewhere. Right up here, Terry's Taco Stand, USA. I could go for a taco. Five for a buck. Sounds horrible. I'd rather go somewhere where there's one for 50 cents. No, this might be the last chance we get for tacos. I need some coffee. I want tacos. Five for a buck, that's like five hamburgers for a buck. No, don't judge a taco by its price. You think you might make a deal? I might. There's a hamburger for 29 cents. Tacos are 29 cents. It's just the cheap place, that's all. Go bargain with them. Editor's note. Only garbled sounds here. Hello? May I help you? Yeah, you have tacos here? Are they Mexican tacos or just regular tacos? I mean, do you have chili in them and things like that? We have cheese and lettuce, and we have sauce, you know, put on them. I mean, do you guarantee that they are authentic Mexican tacos? I don't know. Hey, Lou, do we have authentic Mexican tacos? Woman's voice from the kitchen. What? Authentic Mexican tacos. We have tacos. I don't know how Mexican they are. Yeah, well, I just want to make sure I get what I'm paying for, because they're five for a dollar. I'll take five of them. Taco burger. What's that? Editor's note. Sounds of diesel engine trucks. That's a hamburger with a taco in the middle. Instead of a shell. A taco on a bun. I bet you your tacos are just hamburgers with a shell instead of a bun. I don't know. You just started working here? Today. I thought so. I've never seen you here before. You go to school around here? No, I don't go to school. Oh, why not? Are you sick? Never mind that. We came here for tacos. Editor's note. Here there was a pause. As your attorney, I advise you to get the chili burger. It's a hamburger with chili on it. That's too heavy for me. Then I advise you to get a taco burger. Try that one. The taco has meat in it. I'll try that one. And some coffee now. Right now. So I can drink it while I'm waiting. That's all you want? One taco burger? Well, I'll try it. I might want two. Are your eyes blue or green? Pardon? Blue or green? They change. Like a lizard? Like a cat. Oh, the lizard changes the color of his skin. Want anything to drink? Beer. And I have beer in the car, tons of it. The whole back seat's full of it. I don't like mixing coconuts up with beer and hamburgers. Well, let's smash the bastards right in the middle of the highway. Is Boulder City somewhere around here? Boulder City? Do you want sugar? Yeah. We're in Boulder City, huh? Or very close to it. I don't know. There it is. That sign says Boulder City, okay? Aren't you from Nevada? No. We've never been here before, just traveling through. You just go straight up this road here. Any action up there in Boulder City? Don't ask me. I don't... Any gambling there? I don't know. It's just a little town. Where is the casino? I don't know. 
Wait a minute. Where are you from? New York. And you've just been here a day? No, I've been here for a while. Where do you go around here? Say you wanted to go swimming or something like that. In my backyard. What's the address? Um, go to the... Uh, the pool's not open yet. Let me explain it to you. Let me run it down just briefly if I can. We're looking for the American dream. And we were told it was somewhere in this area. Well, we're here looking for it because they sent us out here all the way from San Francisco to look for it. That's why they gave us this white Cadillac. They figured that we could catch up with it in that. Hey, Lou, you know where the American dream is? She's asking the cook if she knows where the American dream is. Five tacos, one taco burger. Do you know where the American dream is? What's that? What is it? Well, we don't know. We were sent out here from San Francisco to look for the American dream by a magazine to cover it. Oh, you mean a place. A place called the American dream. Is that the old psychiatrist club? I think so. The old psychiatrist club. Old psychiatrist club. It's on paradise. Are you guys serious? Oh, no, honest. Look at that car. I mean, do I look like I'd own a car like that? Could that be the old psychiatrist club? It was a discotheque place. Maybe that's it. It's on Paradise and what? Ross Allen had the old psychiatrist club. Is he the owner now? I don't know. All we were told was, go till you find the American dream. Take this white Cadillac and go find the American dream. It's somewhere in the Las Vegas area. That has to be the old... And it's a silly story to do, but you know, that's what we get paid for. Are you taking pictures of it or... No, no, no pictures. Or did somebody just send you on a goose chase? It's sort of a wild goose chase, more or less, but personally... We're dead serious. That has to be the old psychiatrist club, but the only people who hang out there is a bunch of pushers, peddlers, uppers and downers, and all that stuff. Maybe that's it. Is it a nighttime place, or is it an all-day... Oh, honey, this never stops. But it's not a casino. What kind of place is it? It's on Paradise, uh... The Old Psychiatrist Club on Paradise. Is that what it's called? The Old Psychiatrist Club? No, that is what it used to be. But someone bought it. But I didn't hear about it as the American Dream. It was something like associated with, um... It's a mental joint where all the dopers hang out. A mental joint? You mean like a mental hospital? No, honey, where all the dope peddlers and all the pushers, everybody hangs out. It's a place where all the kids are potted when they go in and everything. But it's not called what you said, the American dream. Do you have any idea what it might be called, or more or less where it might be located? Right off of Paradise and Eastern. But Paradise and Eastern are parallel. Yeah, but I know I come off Eastern... And then I go to paradise. Yeah, I know it. But then that would make it off paradise around the flamingo, straight up here. I think somebody's handed you a... We're staying at the flamingo. I think this place you're talking about and the way you're describing it, I think that maybe that's it. It's not a tourist joint. Well, that's why they sent me. He's the writer. I'm the bodyguard. Because I figure it will be... These guys are nuts. These kids are nuts. That's okay. Yeah, they got new law. 24-hour-a-day violence? Is that what we're saying? Exactly. Now, here's the flamingo. Oh, I can't show you this. I can tell you better my way. Right up here at the first gas station is Tropicana. Take a right. Tropicana to the right. The first gas station is Tropicana. 
take a right on Tropicana and take this way. Right on Tropicana, right on Paradise, you'll see a big black building. It's all painted black and real weird looking. Right on Tropicana, right on Paradise, black building. And there's a sign on the side of the building that says Psychiatrist Club. But they're completely remodeling it and everything. All right, that's close enough. If there's anything I can do for you, honey, I don't know if that's even it or not. But it sounds like it is. I think you boys are on the right track. Right. That's the best lead we've had for two days. We've been asking people all around. I could make a couple calls and sure as hell find out. Could you? Sure, I'll call Alan and ask him. Gee, I'd appreciate that if you could. When you go down to Tropicana, it's not the first gas station, the second. There's a big sign right down the street here. It says, Tropicana Avenue, make a right. And when you get to Paradise, make another right. Okay, big black building, right on Paradise. 24-hour-a-day violence, drugs. See, here's Tropicana, and this is Boulder Highway that goes clear down like that. Well, that's pretty far into town, then. Well, here's Paradise split up somewhere around there. There's Paradise. Yeah, we're down in here. See, this is Boulder Highway and Tropicana. Well, that's not it. That bartender in there is a pothead, too. Yeah, well, it's a lead. You're gonna be glad you stopped here, boys. Only if we find it. Only if we write the article and get it in. Well, why don't you come inside and sit down? We're trying to get as much sun as we can. She's going to make a phone call to find out where it is. Oh, okay. Well, let's go inside. Editor's note. Tape cassettes for the next sequence were impossible to transcribe due to some viscous liquid encrusted behind the heads. There is a certain consistency in the garbled sounds, however, indicating that almost two hours later, Dr. Duke and his attorney finally located what was left of the old psychiatrist's club, a huge slab of cracked, scorched concrete in a vacant lot full of tall weeds. The owner of a gas station across the road said the place had burned down about three years ago. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Disc 5. 10. Heavy duty at the airport. Ugly Peruvian flashback. No, it's too late. Don't try it. My attorney left at dawn. We almost missed the first flight to L.A. because I couldn't find the airport. It was less than 30 minutes from the hotel. I was sure of that. So we left the Flamingo at exactly 7.30. But for some reason, we failed to make the turnoff at the stoplight in front of the Tropicana. We kept going straight ahead on the freeway, which parallels the main airport runway, but on the opposite side from the terminal, and there is no way to get across legally. God damn it, we're lost, my attorney was shouting. What are we doing out here on this godforsaken road? The airport is right over there, he pointed hysterically across the tundra. Don't worry, I said. I've never missed a plane yet. I smiled as the memory came back. Except once in Peru, I added. I was already checked out of the country through customs, but I went back to the bar to chat with this Bolivian cocaine dealer, and all of a sudden I heard those big 707 engines starting up, so I ran out to the runway and tried to get aboard. But the door was right behind the engines, and they'd already rolled the ladder away. Shit, those afterburners would have fried me like bacon. But I was completely out of my head. I was desperate to get aboard. The airport cops saw me coming, and they gathered into a knot at the gate. I was running like a bastard straight at them. The guy with me was screaming, No, it's too late, don't try it. I saw the cops waiting for me, so I slowed down like maybe I'd changed my mind. But when I saw them relax, I did a quick change of pace and tried to run right over the bastards. I laughed. Jesus, it was like running full bore into a closet full of Gila monsters. 
The fuckers almost killed me. All I remember is seeing five or six billy clubs coming down on me at the same time and a lot of voices screaming, No, no, it's suicide! Stop the crazy gringo! I woke up about two hours later in a bar in downtown Lima. They'd stretched me out in one of those half-moon leather booths. My luggage was all stacked beside me. Nobody had opened it. So I went back to sleep and caught the first flight out the next morning. My attorney was only half listening. Look, he said, I'd really like to hear more about your adventures in Peru, but not now. Right now, all I care about is getting across that goddamn runway. We were flashing along at good speed. I was looking for an opening, some kind of access road, some lane across the runway to the terminal. We were five miles past the last stoplight, and there wasn't enough time to turn around and go back to it. There was only one way to make it on time. I hit the brakes and eased the whale down into the grassy moat between the two freeway lanes. The ditch was too deep for a head-on run, so I took it at an angle. The whale almost rolled, but I kept the wheels churning, and we careened up the opposite bank and into the oncoming lane. Fortunately, it was empty. We came out of the moat with the nose of the car up in the air like a hydroplane, then bounced on the freeway and kept right on going into the cactus field on the other side. I recall running over a fence of some kind and dragging it a few hundred yards. But by the time we got to the runway, we were fully under control, screaming along about 60 miles an hour in low gear, and it looked like a wide-open run all the way to the terminal. My only worry was the chance of getting crushed like a roach by an incoming DC-8, which we probably wouldn't see until it was right on top of us. I wondered if they could see us from the tower. Probably so, but why worry? I kept the thing floored. There was no point in turning back. My attorney was hanging onto the dashboard with both hands. I glanced over and saw fear in his eyes. His face appeared to be gray, and I sensed he was not happy with this move. But we were going so fast across the runway, then cactus, then runway again, that I knew he understood our position. We were past the point of debating the wisdom of this move. It was already done, and our only hope was to get to the other side. I looked at my skeleton face Accutron and saw that we had three minutes and fifteen seconds before takeoff. Plenty of time, I said. Get your stuff together. I'll drop you right next to the plane. I could see the big red and silver western jetliner about a thousand yards ahead of us. And by this time we were skimming across smooth asphalt, past the incoming runway. No, he shouted. I can't get out. They'll crucify me. I'll have to take the blame. Ridiculous, I said. Just say you were hitchhiking to the airport and I picked you up. You never saw me before. Shit, this town is full of white Cadillac convertibles. And I plan to go through there so fast that nobody will even glimpse the goddamn license plate. We were approaching the plane. I could see passengers boarding, but so far nobody had noticed us. Approaching from this unlikely direction. Are you ready? I said. He groaned. Why not? But for Christ's sake, let's do it fast. He was scanning the loading area. Then he pointed. Over there, he said. Drop me behind that big van. Just pull in behind it, and I'll jump out where they can't see me. Then you can make a run for it. I nodded. So far, we had all the room we needed. No sign of alarm or pursuit. I wondered if maybe this kind of thing happened all the time in Vegas. Cars full of late-arriving passengers screeching desperately across the runway, dropping off wild-eyed Samoans clutching mysterious canvas bags, who would sprint onto planes at the last possible second and then roar off into the sunrise. Maybe so, I thought. Maybe this kind of thing is standard procedure in this town. I swung in behind the van and hit the brakes just long enough for my attorney to jump out. Don't take any guff from these swine, I yelled. Remember, if you have any trouble, you can always send a telegram to the right people, he grinned. Yeah, 
explaining my position, he said. Some asshole wrote a poem about that once. It's probably good advice, if you have shit for brains. He waved me off. Right, I said, moving out. I'd already spotted a break in the big hurricane fence, and now, with the whale in low gear, I went for it. Nobody seemed to be chasing me. I couldn't understand it. I glanced in the mirror and saw my attorney climbing into the plane. No sign of a struggle. And then I was through the gate and out into the early morning traffic on Paradise Road. I took a fast right on Russell, then a left onto Maryland Parkway, and suddenly I was cruising in warm anonymity past the campus of the University of Las Vegas. No tension on these faces. I stopped at a red light and got lost for a moment in a sunburst of flesh in the crosswalk. Fine sinewy thighs, pink miniskirts, ripe young nipples, sleeveless blouses, long sweeps of blonde hair, pink lips and blue eyes, all the hallmarks of a dangerously innocent culture. I was tempted to pull over and start mumbling obscene entreaties. Hey, sweetie, let's you and me get weird. Jump into this hot dog caddy and we'll flash over to my suite at the Flamingo. Load up on ether and behave like wild animals in my private kidney-shaped pool. Sure we will, I thought. But by this time I was far down the parkway, easing into the turn lane for a left at Flamingo Road back to the hotel to take stock. There was every reason to believe I was heading for trouble, that I'd pushed my luck a bit far. I'd abused every rule Vegas lived by, burning the locals, abusing the tourists, terrifying the help. The only hope now, I felt, was the possibility that we'd gone to such excess with our gig that nobody in a position to bring the hammer down on us could possibly believe it particularly not since we'd signed in with the police conference. When you bring an act into this town, you want to bring it in heavy. Don't waste any time with cheap shucks and misdemeanors. Go straight for the jugular. Get right into felonies. The mentality of Las Vegas is so grossly atavistic that a really massive crime often slips by unrecognized. One of my neighbors recently spent a week in the Vegas jail for vagrancy, He's about 20 years old, long hair, Levi jacket, knapsack, an out front drifter, a straight road person, totally harmless. He just wanders around the country looking for whatever it was that we all thought we'd nailed down in the 60s, sort of an early Bob Zimmerman trip. On a trip from Chicago to L.A., he got curious about Vegas and decided to have a look at it, just passing through, strolling along and digging the sights on the strip. No hurry, why rush? He was standing on a street corner near the Circus Circus, watching the multicolored fountain when the cop cruiser pulled up. Wham! Straight to jail. No phone call, no lawyer, no charge. They put me in the car and took me down to the station, he said. They took me into a big room full of people and told me to take off all my clothes before they booked me. I was standing in front of a big desk about six feet tall with a cop sitting behind it and looking down at me like some kind of medieval judge. The room was full of people, maybe a dozen prisoners, twice that many cops, and about ten policewomen. You had to walk out in the middle of the room, then take everything out of your pockets and put it up on the desk and then strip naked with everybody watching you. I only had about 20 bucks, and the fine for vagrancy was 25. So they put me over on a bench with the people who were going to jail. Nobody hassled me. It was like an assembly line. The two guys right behind me were long hairs, acid people. They'd been picked up for vagrancy, too. But when they started emptying their pockets, the whole room freaked. Between them, they had $130,000, mostly in big bills. The cops couldn't believe it. These guys just kept pulling out wads of money and dumping it up there on the desk, both of them naked and kind of hunched over, not saying anything. The cops went crazy when they saw all that money. 
They started whispering to each other, shit, there was no way they could hold these guys for vagrancy. He laughed. So they charged them with suspicion of evasion of income taxes. They took us all to jail, and these two guys were just about nuts. They were dealers, of course, and they had their stash back in their hotel room. So they had to get out before the cops found out where they were staying. They offered one of the guards a hundred bucks to go out and get the best lawyer in town. And about twenty minutes later, there he was, yelling about habeas corpus and that kind of shit. Hell, I tried to talk to him myself, but this guy had a one-track mind. I told him I could make bail and even pay him something if they'd let me call my father in Chicago, but he was too busy hustling for these other guys. About two hours later, he came back with a guard and said, Let's go. They were out. One of the guys told me while they were waiting that it was going to cost them 30,000 bucks. And I guess it did, but what the hell? That's cheap compared to what would have happened if they hadn't got themselves sprung. They finally let me send a telegram to my old man and he wired me 125 bucks, but it took seven or eight days. I'm not sure how long I was in there because the place didn't have any windows and they fed us every 12 hours. You lose track of time when you can't see the sun. They had 75 guys in each cell, big rooms with a toilet bowl out in the middle. They gave you a pallet when you came in and you slept wherever you wanted. The guy next to me had been in there for 30 years for robbing a gas station. When I finally got out, the cop on the desk took another 25 bucks out of what my father sent me on top of what I owed for the vagrancy fine. What could I say? He just took it. Then he gave me the other $75 and said they had a taxi waiting for me outside for a ride to the airport. And when I got in the cab, the driver said, We're not making any stops, fella, and you'd better not move until we get to the terminal. I didn't move a goddamn muscle. He'd have shot me. I'm sure of that. I went straight to the plane, and I didn't say a word to anybody until I knew we were out of Nevada. Man, that's one place I'll never go back to. 11. Fraud? Larceny? Rape? A brutal connection with the Alice from Linen Service. I was brooding on this tale as I eased the white whale into the Flamingo parking lot. Fifty bucks and a week in jail for just standing on a corner and acting curious? Jesus, what kind of incredible penalties would they spew out on me? I checked off the various charges, but in skeleton legal language form, they didn't seem so bad. Rape? We could surely beat that one. I never even coveted the goddamn girl, much less put my hands on her flesh. Fraud? Larceny? I could always offer to settle, pay it off. Say I was sent out here by Sports Illustrated and then dragged the Time Incorporated lawyers into a nightmare lawsuit, tie them up for years with a blizzard of writs and appeals, attach all their assets in places like Juno and Houston, then constantly file motions for change of venue to Quito, Nome, and Aruba. Keep the thing moving, run them in circles, force them into conflict with the accounting department. Timesheet for Abner H. Dodge, Chief Counsel. Item, $44,066.12. Special outlay to wit. We pursued the defendant, R. Duke, throughout the Western Hemisphere and finally brought him to bay in a village on the north shore of an island known as Culebra in the Caribbean, where his attorneys obtained a ruling that all further proceedings should be conducted in the language of the Carib tribe. We sent three men to Berlitz for this purpose, but 19 hours before the date scheduled for opening arguments, the defendant fled to Colombia, where he established residence in a fishing village called Guajira, near the Venezuelan border, where the official language of jurisprudence is an obscure dialect known as Guajiro. After many months, we were able to establish jurisdiction in this place, but by that time, the defendant had moved his residence to a virtually inaccessible port at the headwaters of the Amazon River, where he cultivated powerful connections with a tribe of headhunters called Hebaros. Our stringer in Manaus, was dispatched upriver to locate and hire a native attorney conversant in Hebrew. 
but the search has been hampered by serious communications problems. There is, in fact, grave concern in our Rio office that the widow of the aforementioned Manaus Stringer might obtain a ruinous judgment due to bias in local courts far larger than anything a jury in our own country would consider reasonable or even sane. Indeed. But what is sane, especially here in our own country, in this doom-struck era of Nixon? We are all wired into a survival trip now. No more of the speed that fueled the 60s. Uppers are going out of style. This was the fatal flaw in Tim Leary's trip. He crashed around America selling consciousness expansion without ever giving a thought to the grim meat-hook realities that were lying in wait for all the people who took him too seriously. After West Point and the priesthood, LSD must have seemed entirely logical to him. But there is not much satisfaction in knowing that he blew it very badly for himself because he took too many others down with him. Not that they didn't deserve it. No doubt they all got what was coming to them. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. But their loss and failure is ours too. What Leary took down with him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped to create. A generation of permanent cripples, failed seekers, who never understood the essential old mystic fallacy of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, is tending that light at the end of the tunnel. This is the same cruel and paradoxically benevolent bullshit that has kept the Catholic Church going for so many centuries. It is also the military ethic, a blind faith in some higher and wiser authority, the Pope, the General, the Prime Minister, all the way up to God. One of the crucial moments of the 60s came on that day when the Beatles cast their lot with the Maharishi. It was like Dylan going to the Vatican to kiss the Pope's ring. First gurus, then when that didn't work, back to Jesus. And now, following Manson's primitive instinct lead, a whole new wave of clan-type commune gods like Mel Lyman, ruler of Avatar, and what's-his-name, who runs Spirit and Flesh. Sonny Barger never quite got the hang of it but he'll never know how close he was to a king-hell breakthrough. The Angels blew it in 1965 at the Oakland-Berkeley line when they acted on Barger's hard-hat con-boss instincts and attacked the front ranks of an anti-war march. This proved to be an historic schism in the then-rising tide of the youth movement of the 60s. It was the first open break between the greasers and the longhairs, and the importance of that break can be read in the history of SDS, which eventually destroyed itself in the doomed effort to reconcile the interests of the lower working-class biker dropout types and the upper-middle Berkeley student activists. Nobody involved in that scene at the time could possibly have foreseen the implications of the Ginsburg-Kesey failure to persuade the Hells Angels to join forces with the radical left from Berkeley. The final split came at Altamont four years later, but by that time it had long been clear to everybody except a handful of rock industry dopers and the national press. The orgy of violence at Altamont merely dramatized the problem. The realities were already fixed. The illness was understood to be terminal, and the energies of the movement were long since aggressively dissipated by the rush to self-preservation. Ah, this terrible gibberish. Grim memories and bad flashbacks looming up from the time fog of Stanion Street. No solace for refugees, no point in looking back. The question, as always, is, now what? I was slumped on my bed in the Flamingo, feeling dangerously out of phase with my surroundings. Something ugly was about to happen, I was sure of it. The room looked like the site of some disastrous zoological experiment involving whiskey and gorillas. 
The ten-foot mirror was shattered, but still hanging together. Bad evidence of that afternoon when my attorney ran amok with the coconut hammer, smashing the mirror and all the light bulbs. We'd replaced the lights with a package of red and blue Christmas tree lights from Safeway, but there was no hope of replacing the mirror. My attorney's bed looked like a burned-out rat's nest. Fire had consumed the top half, and the rest was a mass of wire and charred stuffing. Luckily, the maids hadn't come near the room since that awful confrontation on Tuesday. I'd been asleep when the maid came in that morning. We'd forgotten to hang out the Do Not Disturb sign. So she wandered into the room and startled my attorney, who was kneeling, stark naked, in the closet, vomiting into his shoes, thinking he was actually in the bathroom, and then suddenly looking up to see a woman with a face like Mickey Rooney, staring down at him, unable to speak, trembling with fear and confusion. She was holding that mop like an axe handle, he said later. So I came out of the closet in a kind of running crouch, still vomiting, and hit her right at the knees. It was pure instinct. I thought she was ready to kill me. And then when she screamed, that's when I put the ice bag on her mouth. Yes, I remembered that scream. One of the most terrifying sounds I'd ever heard. I woke up and saw my attorney grappling desperately on the floor right next to my bed with what appeared to be an old woman. The room was full of powerful electric noise, the TV set hissing at top volume on a non-existent channel. I could barely hear the woman's muffled cries as she struggled to get the ice bag away from her face. But she was no match for my attorney's naked bulk, and he finally managed to pin her in a corner behind the TV set. Clamping his hands on her throat while she babbled pitifully, "'Please, please, I'm only the maid. I didn't mean nothing.' I was out of bed in a flash, grabbing my wallet and waving the Gold Policeman's Benevolent Association press badge in front of her face. "'You're under arrest!' I shouted. "'No!' she groaned. "'I just wanted to clean up!' My attorney got to his feet, breathing heavily. "'She must have used a passkey,' he said. "'I was polishing my shoes in the closet when I noticed her sneaking in, so I took her.' He was trembling, drooling vomit off his chin— and I could see at a glance that he understood the gravity of this situation. Our behavior this time had gone far past the boundaries of private kinkiness. Here we were, both naked, staring down at a terrified old woman, a hotel employee, stretched out on the floor of our suite in a paroxysm of fear and hysteria. She would have to be dealt with. "'What made you do it?' I asked her. "'Who paid you off?' Nobody, she wailed. I'm the maid. You're lying, shouted my attorney. You are after the evidence. Who put you up to this, the manager? I work for the hotel, she said. All I do is clean up the rooms. I turned to my attorney. This means they know what we have, I said. So they sent this poor old woman up here to steal it. No, she yelled. I don't know what you're talking about. Bullshit, said my attorney. You're just as much a part of it as they are. Part of what? The dope ring, I said. You must know what's going on in this hotel. Why do you think we're here? She stared at us, trying to speak, but only blubbering. I know you're cops, she said finally. But I thought you were just here for that convention. I swear, all I wanted to do was clean up your room. I don't know anything about dope. My attorney laughed. Come on, baby. Don't try to tell us you never heard of the Grange Gorman. No, she yelled. No, I swear to Jesus, I never heard of that stuff. My attorney seemed to think for a moment. Then he leaned down to help the old lady to her feet. Maybe she's telling the truth he said to me. Maybe she's not part of it. No, I swear I'm not, she howled. Well, I said, in that case, maybe we won't have to put her away. Maybe she can help. Yes, she said eagerly. I'll help you all you need. I hate dope. So do we, lady, I said. I think we should put her on the payroll, 
said my attorney. Have her checked out. Then line her up for a big one each month, depending on what she comes up with. The old woman's face had changed markedly. She no longer seemed disturbed to find herself chatting with two naked men, one of whom had tried to strangle her just a few moments earlier. Do you think you could handle it? I asked her. What? One phone call every day, said my attorney. Just tell us what you've seen. He patted her on the shoulder. Don't worry if it doesn't add up. That's our problem. She grinned. You'd pay me for that? You're damn right, I said. But the first time you say anything about this to anybody, you'll go straight to prison for the rest of your life. She nodded. I'll help any way that I can, she said. But who should I call? Don't worry, said my attorney. What's your name? Alice, she said. Just ring linen service and ask for Alice. You'll be contacted, I said. It'll take about a week. But meanwhile, just keep your eyes open and try to act normal. Can you do that? Oh, yes, sir, she said. Will I see you gentlemen again? She grinned sheepishly. After this, I mean. No, said my attorney. They sent us down from Carson City. You'll be contacted by Inspector Rock, Arthur Rock. He'll be posing as a politician, but you won't have any trouble recognizing him. She seemed to be shuffling nervously. What's wrong? I said. Is there something you haven't told us? Oh, no, she said quickly. I was just wondering who's going to pay me. Inspector Rock will take care of that, I said. It'll all be in cash. A thousand dollars on the ninth of every month. Oh, Lord, she exclaimed. I'll do just about anything for that. You and a lot of other people, said my attorney. You'd be surprised who we have on the payroll, right here in this same hotel. She looked stricken. Would I know them? Probably, I said, but they're all undercover. The only way you'll ever know is if something really serious happens and one of them has to contact you in public with the password. What is it? she asked. One hand washes the other, I said. The minute you hear that, you say, I fear nothing. That way they'll know you. She nodded, repeating the code several times while we listened to make sure she had it right. Okay, said my attorney. That's it for now. We probably won't be seeing you again until the hammer comes down. You'll be better off ignoring us until we leave. Don't bother to make up the room. Just leave a pile of towels and soap outside the door exactly at midnight. He smiled. That way... We won't have to risk another one of these little incidents, will we? She moved toward the door. Whatever you say, gentlemen. I can't tell you how sorry I am about what happened, but it was only because I didn't realize. My attorney ushered her out. We understand, he said gently. But it's all over now. Thank God for the decent people. She smiled as she closed the door behind her. Twelve. Return to the circus circus, looking for the ape. To hell with the American dream. Almost seventy-two hours had passed since that strange encounter, and no maid had set foot in the room. I wondered what Alice had told them. We had seen her once trundling a laundry cart across the parking area as we rolled up in the whale. But we offered no sign of recognition, and she seemed to understand. But it couldn't last much longer. The room was full of used towels. They were hanging everywhere. The bathroom floor was about six inches deep with soap bars, vomit, and grapefruit rinds mixed with broken glass. I had to put my boots on every time I went in there to piss. The nap of the mottled gray rug was so thick with marijuana seeds that it appeared to be turning green. 
The general back alley ambiance of the suite was so rotten, so incredibly foul, that I figured I could probably get away with claiming it was some kind of life slice exhibit that we'd brought down from Hate Street to show cops from other parts of the country how deep into filth and degeneracy the drug people will sink if left to their own devices. But what kind of addict would need all these coconut husks and crushed honeydew rinds? Would the presence of junkies account for all these uneaten French fries? These puddles of glazed ketchup on the bureau? Maybe so. But then why all this booze? And these crude pornographic photos, ripped out of pulp magazines like Whores of Sweden and Orgies in the Casbah, that were plastered on the broken mirror with smears of mustard that had dried to a hard yellow crust, and all these signs of violence, these strange red and blue bulbs and shards of broken glass embedded in the wall plaster. No, these were not the hoof prints of your normal, God-fearing junkie. It was far too savage, too aggressive. There was evidence in this room of excessive consumption of almost every type of drug known to civilized man since 1544 A.D., it could only be explained as a montage, a sort of exaggerated medical exhibit put together very carefully to show what might happen if 22 serious drug felons, each with a different addiction, were penned up together in the same room for five days and nights without relief. Indeed. But of course that would never happen in real life, gentlemen. We just put this thing together for demonstration purposes. Suddenly the phone was ringing jerking me out of my fantasy stupor. I looked at it. Ring! Jesus! What now? Is this it? I could almost hear the shrill voice of the manager, Mr. Heem, saying the police were on their way up to my room, and would I please not shoot through the door when they began kicking it down? Ring! No, they wouldn't call first. Once they decided to take me, they would probably set an ambush in the elevator. First a mace, then a gang swarm. It would come with no warning. So I picked up the phone. It was my friend, Bruce Innes, calling from the Circus Circus. He had located the man who wanted to sell the ape I'd been inquiring about. The price was $750. What kind of greed head are we dealing with? I said. Last night it was 400. He claims he just found out it was housebroken, said Bruce. He let it sleep in the trailer last night, and the thing actually shit in the shower stall. That doesn't mean anything, I said. Apes are attracted to water. Next time it'll shit in the sink. Maybe you should come down and argue with the guy, said Bruce. He's here in the bar with me. I told him you really wanted the ape and that you could give it a fine home. I think he'll negotiate. He's really attached to this stinking thing. It's here in the bar with us, sitting up on a goddamn stool, slobbering into a beer schooner. Okay, I said. I'll be there in ten minutes. Don't let the bastard get drunk. I want to meet him under natural conditions. When I got to the circus circus, they were loading an old man into an ambulance outside the main door. What happened? I asked the carkeeper. I'm not sure, he said. Somebody said he had a stroke, but I noticed the back of his head was all cut up. He slid into the whale and handed me a stub. You want me to save your drink for you? He asked, holding up a big glass of tequila that was on the seat of the car. I can put it in the cooler if you want. I nodded. These people were familiar with my habits. I had been in and out of the place so often with Bruce and the other band members that the car keepers knew me by name although I'd never introduced myself and nobody had ever asked me. I just assumed it was all part of the gig here, that they'd probably rifled the glove compartment and found a notebook with my name on it. The real reason, which didn't occur to me at the time, was that I was still wearing my ID badge from the district attorney's conference. It was dangling from the pocket flap of my multicolored bird shooting jacket, but I'd long since forgotten about it. No doubt they all assumed I was some kind of super weird undercover agent. Or maybe not. Maybe they were just humoring me because they figured anybody crazy enough to pose as a cop while driving around Vegas in a white Cadillac convertible with a drink in his hand 
almost had to be heavy, and perhaps even dangerous. In a scene where nobody with any ambition is really what he appears to be, there's not much risk in acting like a King Hell freak. The overseers will nod wisely at each other and mutter about these goddamn no-class put-ons. The other side of that coin is the God damn, who's that? syndrome. This comes from people like doormen and floor walkers who assume that anybody who acts crazy but still tips big must be important, which means he should be humored or at least treated gently. But none of this makes any difference with a head full of mescaline. You just blunder around doing anything that seems to be right, and it usually is. Vegas is so full of natural freaks people who are genuinely twisted, that drugs aren't really a problem, except for cops and the Skag Syndicate. Psychedelics are almost irrelevant in a town where you can wander into a casino any time of the day or night and witness the crucifixion of a gorilla on a flaming neon cross that suddenly turns into a pinwheel, spinning the beast around in wild circles above the crowded gambling action. I found Bruce at the bar, but there was no sign of the ape. Where is it? I demanded. I'm ready to write a check. I want to take the bastard back home on the plane with me. I've already reserved two first-class seats. Our Duke and son. Take him on the plane? Hell yes, I said. You think they'd say anything? Call attention to my son's infirmities? He shrugged. Forget it, he said. They just took him away. He attacked an old man right here at the bar. The creep started hassling the bartender about allowing barefoot rabble in the place. And just about then, the ape let out a shriek. So the old guy threw a beer at him, and the ape went crazy. Came out of his seat like a jack-in-the-box and took a big bite out of the old man's head. The bartender had to call an ambulance. Then the cops came and took the ape away. God damn it, I said. What's the bail? I want that ape. Get a grip on yourself, he said. You better stay clear of that jail. That's all they'd need to put the cuffs on you. Forget that ape. You don't need him. I gave it some thought, then decided he was probably right. There was no sense blowing everything for the sake of some violent ape I'd never even met. For all I knew, he'd take a bite out of my head if I tried to bail him out. It would take him a while to calm down after the shock of being put behind bars, and I couldn't afford to wait around. When are you taking off? Bruce asked. As soon as possible, I said. No point hanging around this town any longer. I have all I need. Anything else would only confuse me. He seemed surprised. You found the American dream? He said. In this town? I nodded. We're sitting on the main nerve right now, I said. You remember that story the manager told us about the owner of this place? How he always wanted to run away and join the circus when he was a kid? Bruce ordered two more beers. He looked over the casino for a moment, then shrugged. Yeah, I see what you mean, he said. Now the bastard has his own circus and a license to steal, too. He nodded. You're right. He's the model. Absolutely, I said. It's pure Horatio Alger, all the way down to his attitude. I tried to have a talk with him, but some heavy-sounding dyke who claimed to be his executive secretary told me to fuck off. She said he hates the press worse than anything else in America. Him and Spiro Agnew, Bruce muttered. They're both right, I said. I tried to tell the woman that I agreed with everything he stood for, but she said if I knew what was good for me, I'd get the hell out of town and not even think about bothering the boss. He really hates reporters, she said. I don't mean this to sound like a warning, but if I were you, I'd take it that way. Bruce nodded. The boss was paying him a thousand bucks a week to work two sets a night in the Leopard Lounge and another two grand for the group. All they had to do was make a hell of a lot of noise for two hours every night. The boss didn't give a flying fuck what kind of songs they sang, just as long as the beat was heavy and the amps were turned up loud enough to lure people into the bar. It was strange to sit there in Vegas and hear Bruce singing powerful stuff like 
Chicago, and country song. If the management had bothered to hear the lyrics, the whole band would have been tarred and feathered. Several months later in Aspen, Bruce sang the same songs in a club jammed with tourists and a former astronaut, whose name has been deleted at the insistence of the publisher's lawyer. And when the last set was over, the astronaut came over to our table and began yelling all kinds of drunken, super-patriot gibberish, hitting on Bruce about, What kind of nerve does a goddamn Canadian have to come down here and insult this country? Say, man, I said, I'm an American, I live here, and I agree with every fucking word he says. At this point, the hash bouncers appeared, grinning inscrutably and saying, Good evening to you gentlemen. The E. Jing says it's time to be quiet, right? And nobody hassles the musicians in this place, is that clear? The astronaut left, muttering darkly about using his influence to get something done damn quick about the immigration statutes. What's your name? He asked me as the hash bouncers eased him away. Bob Zimmerman, I said, and if there's one thing I hate in this world, it's a goddamn bonehead Polak. You think I'm a Polak? He screamed. You dirty gold bricker, you're all shit. You don't represent this country. Christ, let's hope to hell you don't, Bruce muttered. The astronaut was still raving as they muscled him out to the street. The next night in another restaurant... The astronaut was scarfing up his chow, stone sober, when a 14-year-old boy approached the table to ask for his autograph. The astronaut acted coy for a moment, feigning embarrassment. Then he scrawled his signature on the small piece of paper the boy handed him. The boy looked at it for a moment, then tore it into small pieces and dropped it in the astronaut's lap. "'Not everybody loves you, man,' he said." Then he went back and sat down at his own table about six feet away. The astronaut's party was speechless. Eight or ten people, wives, managers, and favored senior engineers, showing the astronaut a good time in fabulous Aspen. Now they looked like somebody had just sprayed their table with shit mist. Nobody said a word. They ate quickly and left without tipping. So much for Aspen and astronauts. He would never have that kind of trouble in Las Vegas. A little bit of this town goes a very long way. After five days in Vegas, you feel like you've been here for five years. Some people say they like it, but then some people like Nixon, too. He would have made a perfect mayor for this town, with John Mitchell as sheriff and Agnew as master of sewers. 13. End of the road. Death of the whale. Soaking sweats in the airport. When I tried to sit down at the Baccarat table, the bouncers put the arm on me. You don't belong here, one of them said quietly. Let's go outside. Why not, I said. They took me to the front entrance and signaled for the whale to be brought up. "'Where's your friend?' they asked while we waited. "'What friend?' "'The big spick.' "'Look,' I said, "'I'm a doctor of journalism. "'You'd never catch me hanging around this place with a goddamn spick.' "'They laughed. "'And what about this?' they said. "'And they confronted me with a big photograph of me and my attorney "'sitting at a table in the floating bar. "'I shrugged. That's not me, I said. That's a guy named Thompson. He works for Rolling Stone. A really vicious, crazy kind of person. And that guy sitting next to him is a hitman for the mafia in Hollywood. Shit, have you studied this photograph? What kind of maniac would roam around Vegas wearing one black glove? We noticed that, they said. Where is he now? I shrugged. He moves around pretty fast, I said. His orders come out of St. Louis. They stared at me. How do you know all this stuff? I showed them my gold PBA badge, flashing it quickly with my back to the crowd. Act natural, I whispered. Don't put me on the spot. 
They were still standing there when I drove off in the whale. The geek had brought it up at exactly the right moment. I gave him a five-dollar bill and hit the street with a stylish screech of rubber. It was all over now. I drove across to the Flamingo and loaded all my luggage into the car. I tried to put the top up for privacy, but something was wrong with the motor. The generator light had been on, fiery red, ever since I'd driven the thing into Lake Mead on a water test. A quick run along the dashboard disclosed that every circuit in the car was totally fucked. Nothing worked, not even the headlights. And when I hit the air conditioner button, I heard a nasty explosion under the hood. The top was jammed about halfway up, but I decided to try for the airport. If this goddamn junker wouldn't run right, I could always abandon it and call a cab. To hell with this garbage from Detroit. They shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. The sun was coming up when I got to the airport. I left the whale in the VIP parking lot. A kid about 15 years old checked it in, but I refused to answer his questions. He was very excited about the overall condition of the vehicle. Holy God, he kept shouting. How did this happen? He kept moving around the car, pointing at various dents, rips, and crushed places. I know, I said. They beat the shit out of it. This is a terrible goddamn town for driving around in convertibles. The worst time was right out on the boulevard in front of the Sahara. You know that corner where all the junkies hang out? Jesus, I couldn't believe it when they all went crazy at once. The kid was none too bright. His face had gone blank early on, and now he seemed in a state of mute fear. Don't worry, I said. I'm insured. I showed him the contract, pointing to the small print clause where it said I was insured against all damages for only two dollars a day. The kid was still nodding when I fled. I felt a bit guilty about leaving him to deal with the car. There was no way to explain the massive damage. It was finished, a wreck, totaled out. Under normal circumstances, I would have been seized and arrested when I tried to turn it in. But not at this hour of the morning, with only this kid to deal with. I was, after all, a VIP. Otherwise, they would never have charted the car to me in the first place. Let the chickens come home to roost, I thought, as I hurried into the airport. It was still too early to act normal, so I hunkered down in the coffee shop behind the L.A. Times. Somewhere down the corridor, a jukebox was playing, one toke over the line. I listened for a moment, but my nerve ends were no longer receptive. The only song I might have been able to relate to at that point was Mr. Tambourine Man, or maybe... Memphis Blues again. Oh, mama, can this really be the end? My plane left at eight, which meant I had two hours to kill, feeling desperately visible. There was no doubt in my mind that they were looking for me. The net was closing down. It was only a matter of time before they ran me down like some kind of rabid animal. I checked all my luggage through the chute, all but the leather satchel, which was full of drugs, and the 357. Did they have the goddamn metal detector system in this airport? I strolled around to the boarding gate and tried to look casual while I cased the area for black boxes. None was visible. I decided to take the chance, just zip through the gate with a big smile on my face, mumbling distractedly about a bad slump in the hardware market. Just another failed salesman checking out. Blame it all on that bastard Nixon. Indeed. I decided it might look more natural if I found somebody to chat with. A routine line of small talk between passengers. How are you, fella? I guess you're probably wondering what makes me sweat like this. Yeah, well, goddamn, man. Have you read the newspapers today? You'd never believe what those dirty bastards have done this time. I figured that would cover it, but I couldn't find anybody who looked safe enough to talk to. The whole airport was full of people who looked like they might go for my floating rib if I made a false move. I felt very paranoid like some kind of criminal skull-sucker on the lamb from Scotland Yard. Everywhere I looked, I saw pigs, because on that morning the Las Vegas airport was full of cops. 
the mass exodus after the climax of the district attorney's conference. When I finally put this together, I felt much better about the health of my own brain. Everything seems to be ready. Are you ready? Ready? Well, why not? This is a heavy day in Vegas. A thousand cops are checking out of town, scurrying through the airport in groups of three and six. They are heading back home. The drug conference is finished. The airport lounge is humming with mean talk and bodies. Short beers and Bloody Marys. Here and there a victim of chest rash, rubbing Mexana under the armpit straps of a thick shoulder holster. No point hiding this business any longer. Let it all hang out. Or at least get some air to it. Yes, thank you kindly. I think I busted a button on my trousers. I hope they don't fall down. You don't want my trousers to fall down now, do you? Fuck no, not today. Not right here in the middle of the Las Vegas airport on this sweaty hard morning at the tail end of this mass meeting on narcotics and dangerous drugs. When the train come in the station, I looked her in the eye. Grim music in this airport. Yes, it's hard to tell, it's hard to tell, when all your love's in vain. Every now and then you run up on one of those days when everything's in vain. A stone bummer from start to finish. And if you know what's good for you, on days like these you sort of hunker down in a safe corner and watch. Maybe think a bit. Lay back on a cheap wooden chair screened off from the traffic and shrewdly rip the pop tops out of five or eight Budweiser's. Smoke off a pack of King Marlboros, eat a peanut butter sandwich, and finally, toward evening, gobble up a wad of good mescaline. Then drive out, later on, to the beach. Get out in the surf, in the fog, and slosh along on numb, frozen feet about ten yards out from the tide line, stomping through tribes of wild sandpeckers, ride runners, whore hoppers, stupid little birds and crabs and salt suckers, with here and there a big pervert or woolly reject gimping off in the distance, wandering alone by themselves behind the dunes and driftwood. These are the ones you will never be properly introduced to, at least not if your luck holds. But the beach is less complicated than a boiling fast morning in the Las Vegas airport. I felt very obvious. Amphetamine psychosis? Paranoid dementia? What is it? My Argentine luggage? This crippled, loping walk that once made me a reject from the naval ROTC? Indeed. This man will never be able to walk straight, Captain, because one leg is longer than the other. Not much. Three-eighths of an inch or so, which counted out to about two-eighths more than the captain could tolerate. So we parted company. He accepted a command in the South China Sea, and I became a doctor of gonzo journalism. And many years later, killing time in the Las Vegas airport this terrible morning, I picked up a newspaper and saw where the captain had fucked up very badly. Ship commander butchered by natives after accidental assault on Guam. AOP aboard the USS Crazy Horse, somewhere in the Pacific, September 25th. The entire 3,465-man crew of this newest American aircraft carrier is in violent mourning today, after five crewmen, including the captain, were diced up like pineapple meat in a brawl with the heroin police at the neutral port of Hong Si. Dr. Bloor, the ship's chaplain, presided over tense funeral services at dawn on the flight deck. The Fourth Fleet Service Choir sang Tom Thumb's Blues. And then, while the ship's bells tolled frantically, the remains of the five were set afire in a gourd and hurled into the Pacific by a hooded officer known only as the Commander. Shortly after the services ended, the crewmen fell to fighting among themselves, and all communications with the ship were severed for an indefinite period. 
Official spokesman at 4th Fleet Headquarters on Guam said the Navy had no comment on the situation, pending the results of a top-level investigation by a team of civilian specialists headed by former New Orleans District Attorney James Garrison. Why bother with newspapers if this is all they offer? Agnew was right. The press is a gang of cruel faggots. Journalism is not a profession or a trade. It's a cheap catch-all for fuck-offs and misfits, a false doorway to the backside of life, a filthy, piss-ridden little hole nailed off by the building inspector, but just deep enough for a wino to curl up from the sidewalk and masturbate like a chimp in a zoo cage. Fourteen. Farewell to Vegas. God's mercy on you, swine. As I skulked around the airport, I realized that I was still wearing my police identification badge. It was a flat orange rectangle, sealed in clear plastic that said, Raoul Duke, Special Investigator, Los Angeles. I saw it in the mirror above the urinal. Get rid of this thing, I thought. Tear it off. The gig is finished. And it proved nothing, at least not to me, and certainly not to my attorney, who also had a badge. But now he was back in Malibu, nursing his paranoid sores. It had been a waste of time, a lame fuck-around that was only, in clear retrospect, a cheap excuse for a thousand cops to spend a few days in Las Vegas and lay the bill on the taxpayers. Nobody had learned anything, or at least nothing new, except maybe me. And all I learned was that the National District Attorneys Association is about ten years behind the grim truth and harsh kinetic realities of what they have only just recently learned to call the drug culture in this foul year of our Lord, 1971. They are still burning the taxpayers for thousands of dollars to make films about the dangers of LSD at a time when acid is widely known to everybody but cops to be the Studebaker of the drug market. The popularity of psychedelics has fallen off so drastically that most volume dealers no longer even handle quality acid or mescaline except as a favor to special customers, mainly jaded, over-30 drug dilettantes like me and my attorney. The big market these days is in downers, reds and smack, secondol and heroin, and a hell broth of bad domestic grass sprayed with everything from arsenic to horse tranquilizers. What sells today is whatever fucks you up, whatever short-circuits your brain and grounds it out for the longest possible time. The ghetto market is mushroomed into suburbia, the Milltown man has turned with a vengeance to skin popping and even mainlining. And for every ex speed freak who drifted for relief into smack, there are 200 kids who went straight to the needle off second all. They never even bothered to try speed. Uppers are no longer stylish. Methadrine is almost as rare on the 1971 market as pure acid or DMT. Consciousness expansion went out with LBJ, and it is worth noting, historically, that downers came in with Nixon. I limped onto the plane with no problem except a wave of ugly vibrations from the other passengers. But my head was so burned out by then that I wouldn't have cared if I'd had to climb aboard stark naked and covered with oozing shankers. It would have taken extreme physical force to keep me off that plane. I was so far beyond simple fatigue that I was beginning to feel nicely adjusted to the idea of permanent hysteria. I felt like the slightest misunderstanding with the stewardess would cause me to either cry or go mad. And the woman seemed to sense this, because she treated me very gently. When I wanted more ice cubes for my Bloody Mary, she brought them quickly— and when I ran out of cigarettes, she gave me a pack from her own purse. The only time she seemed nervous was when I pulled a grapefruit out of my satchel and began slicing it up with a hunting knife. I noticed her watching me closely, so I tried to smile. I never go anywhere without grapefruit, 
I said. It's hard to get a really good one, unless you're rich. She nodded. I flashed her the grimace smile again, but it was hard to know what she was thinking. It was entirely possible I knew that she'd already decided to have me taken off the plane in a cage when we got to Denver. I stared fixedly into her eyes for a time, but she kept herself under control. I was asleep when our plane hit the runway, but the jolt brought me instantly awake. I looked out the window and saw the Rocky Mountains. What the fuck was I doing here? I wondered. It made no sense at all. I decided to call my attorney as soon as possible, have him wire me some money to buy a huge albino Doberman. Denver is a national clearinghouse for stolen Dobermans. They come from all parts of the country. Since I was already here, I thought I might as well pick up a vicious dog. But first, something for my nerves. Immediately after the plane landed, I rushed up the corridor to the airport drugstore and asked the clerk for a box of Amos. She began to fidget and shake her head. Oh, no, she said finally. I can't sell those things except by prescription. I know, I said. But you see, I'm a doctor. I don't need a prescription. She was fidgeting. Well, you'll have to show me some ID, she moaned. Of course. I jerked out my wallet and let her see the police badge while I flipped through the deck until I located my ecclesiastical discount card, which identifies me as a doctor of divinity, a certified minister of the church of the new truth. She inspected it carefully, then handed it back. I sensed a new respect in her manner. Her eyes grew warm. She seemed to want to touch me. I hope you'll forgive me, doctor, she said with a fine smile. But I had to ask. We get some real freaks in this place, all kinds of dangerous addicts. You'd never believe it. Don't worry, I said. I understand perfectly. But I have a bad heart, and I hope... Certainly, she exclaimed. And within seconds, she was back with a dozen Amels. I paid without quibbling about the ecclesiastical discount. Then I opened the box and cracked one under my nose immediately while she watched. Just be thankful your heart is young and strong, I said. If I were you, I would never... Ah! Holy shit! What? Yes, you'll have to excuse me now. I feel it coming on. I turned away and reeled off in the general direction of the bar. God's mercy on you, swine! I shouted at two marines coming out of the men's room. They looked at me but said nothing. By this time I was laughing crazily. But it made no difference. I was just another fucked up cleric with a bad heart. Shit. They'll love me down at the Brown Palace. I took another big hit off the Amel. And by the time I got to the bar, my heart was full of joy. I felt like a monster reincarnation of Horatio Alger. A man on the move. And just sick enough to be totally confident.